Hey, what's going on, The Dwelling Place? My name is Peach. I am the teacher, speaker, whatever, for The Dwelling Place, and I am so happy that you guys are here with us today. Uh, sorry we're a little bit behind because the Wi-Fi in Anchorage kind of went on the fritz, but that's kind of like one of the negatives about an online church, right, is you rely on the Wi-Fi, and if you don't have it, then you got to wait a little bit. But that's another beautiful thing about the internet, right, is you don't always have to rely on schedules. In fact, most of the people who watch our services don't even watch live. They watch throughout the week when they can. <laughs> so it uh, just kind of is what it is, and I'm super grateful for that, and I'm super grateful for you guys to be with me today. Thank you for joining us, and we're going to have a great day. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed our guest speaker last week. That was a Dwelling Place's second guest speaker ever. His name is Pastor Lance Kramer with Changepoint Cotsview. He's actually my father-in-law, if you didn't know that. Um, you know, he helped me a lot, taught me a lot when it came, comes to church and ministry. So super thankful for him to come down here and share with us. And on the 22nd of January this month, I will be in Kotzebue preaching uh, for Change Point Kotzebue. So that's going to be fun too. Be looking forward to that. And I'll make sure that uh, we also have a service here as well for the dwelling place. So um so let's get into it. If you guys uh, don't know, we've been over the last several weeks, we've been going over a sermon series called The Real Story of dot dot dot, and we just wrapped it up. Now, this sermon series was about all the old Bible stories that we learned growing up as kids in Bible school, right? Noah's Ark, Moses, Joseph. We went through some of the big stories in the Bible and how like we learn about God as an adult, right? Because as a kid, we kind of pull different things out of it versus when we're growing up now, like understanding millions of people were killed in the flood. Like we, we want to know about God in the midst of these things. And we ended, it was kind of like a really cool timing. We ended with the birth of Jesus on Christmas. So that worked out like super well. And we decided, hey, since we ended with the birth of Jesus on Christmas uh, at the beginning of Matthew, Let's continue and go through the life of Jesus in Matthew. So over the next several weeks, this will probably take us, I'm thinking, uh, into March, if not into April or further, we're going to be walking through the book of Matthew. Now there's 28 chapters in Matthew. Uh, I don't think we're going to do one chapter every week. We may jump a little bit. We may slow down a little bit at times, but we're going to be going through Matthew for a long time, and I am so excited because... You have the epistles, you have the letters, you have all the like, all the great things in the Bible, right? But actually getting to learn about the life of Jesus and what he's done and just who he was as a man, uh, it opens up our understanding about who he is as our God. You know, the prophecies that he's fulfilled, the life that he lived, the people that he touched, what happened on the cross, the, the, his walk with his father, his walk with the spirit, his walk with his disciples. We want to be picking out the amazing things about Jesus, which is everything, right? We want to pick out Jesus and learn about him to fall more in love with him and in relationship with him and with each other. So that's where we're going to start today. We're going to go ahead and jump into it after I uh, open us up with a word of prayer. So Father, in Jesus' name, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for the love that you have for me. Thank you for the love that you have for those who are watching. Thank you for the love that you have for your children, God. I, I am so grateful for you that we have this opportunity to come together online across the world, no matter where we are, God. We're united through you on this awesome thing that's called the internet, Jesus, and uh God, it's really incredible. So thank you, Jesus. I pray for your Holy Spirit to be all over this message. And whether you're watching live right now, whether you're watching throughout the week, if you're listening to it on the podcast, God, whatever it is, I just pray for your Holy Spirit to teach and to correct, to convict us of sin, to draw us closer to you throughout this time, and that we can turn off this message knowing you more than we did when we turned it on. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Cool. Okay, let's get started, guys. We're going to open us up today to Matthew chapter 3. Now, I'm going to a little bit paraphrase John the Baptist. Now, don't get me wrong. John the Baptist is a huge part 
of the gospel. I don't want to pretend that he doesn't matter. Uh, But today, we're not focusing so much on John the Baptist as we are focusing on Jesus. We're going to be going through the baptism of Jesus into the temptation of Jesus in the desert. Um, And again, since I don't have internet right now, I cannot pull up uh, the scriptures. They'd actually be over here. I can't pull up the scriptures that would be right here. So we're doing it old school, straight from the Bible. So if you don't have your Bible, go grab it. I don't know why I did an accent there, but whatever. Just go get it. Okay, so here's what's going on. We ended with the birth of Jesus. Now, Jesus was born. His family had to flee all over the place because of King Herod, who was out there committing infanticide, killing kids, trying to destroy who the the Messiah would be, right? So he had belief that the Messiah was coming, but not like this saving faith that we talked about on our podcast. He was just out there trying to destroy people. I mean, kids. To stop Jesus from being born. Well, that didn't work out because you can't stop God when God has something going on. You just can't do it. Uh, That's what we call omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He is sovereign. He is in control. You can't stop him. You can't outsmart him. God is God. You are you. And Herod learned that the hard way, right? And so after all of this, Jesus grew up with his family. He had his mom and his dad. Joseph was uh, a carpenter or more like the according to the word for the job that he was he was actually closer to like a builder almost an architect but not quite but the builder had a difficult job because they planted trees and then they had to cut down the trees they had to make their own lumber and then from their lumber they built the things that were to be made and so Jesus followed in the steps of his adopted earthly dad Joseph for his life so Jesus was skilled in the ways of carpentry and in building and in creating lumber. He, you, you can imagine that after 30 years of this, this dude was tough, right? He had, he had man hands. Now, do you know, uh, I know people in, in the villages up north know what it's like. I don't know if you're not, uh, wherever you're listening from, like when you're commercial fishing, you know, your hands just get tired and, and at the end of the summer, your fingers are swollen and it's hard to like, grip your hands like this and you just permanently smell like fish for a while and then and then throughout the summer you don't just commercial fish right you have to go out and you get wood from up river you're splitting logs you're working with wood you're just making sure during the summer that you have everything taken care of and even through the course of just one summer you can look completely different from the beginning of the summer to the end of it just because of the hard work that you had to put in to prepare for the winter And Jesus did this year-round for 30 years. So we get these pictures of Jesus on our wall of like this beautiful, like sponsored by, actually probably like sponsored by Dove, uh, you know, pun intended, shampoo and conditioner, and it's suave and it's like gorgeous. There's not a flake on his head, no danger for Jesus, you know. He doesn't need head and shoulders. He uses Dove shampoo. And he has these like beautiful green eyes and he's looking up into the heavens with like this dainty pearly face. But you know what? That's not the picture of Jesus that we see in the Bible. This dude worked. He worked hard. You know he had strong hands. He had strong arms. He was a guy who knew what it was like to put in the work, to provide for his family, to to do the things that he needed to do. He was skilled in a trade. However, he did not find his identity in his trade. He was with his father working in it, right? And father being Joseph, not God at this point. Well, according to uh, Jewish custom, right, it is customary for kids or whatever to attend school, to do all these things. And then at the age of 30, they are able to begin a life in ministry should they choose. And that's where we're at here. Verse or Chapter 3 starts off with this crazy voice in the wilderness about, uh, it says in verse uh, 3, it says, The voice of one crying in, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now it's talking about John, and John was this like, John was a dude, right? John was a dude. Um, he was just a guy being dude. This guy lived in the desert. He wore, listen to this, verse 4 says, John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. Now, that's not like comfortable. Like this isn't, this isn't like a fashionista right here. He's wearing camel hair. 
camel hair, okay? Just picture that. He's wearing, he's wearing a garment of camel hair and a leather belt. He's out in the wilderness, and he's eating honey and locusts, like locusts, like the bug, locusts. This guy is out there looking crazy, and he's crying out to people to, to repent and to be baptized, to make straight the path of the Lord. Now, this was a spectacle, and let me tell you why. Do you remember the other day when we talked about there was a 400-year silence where God did not speak through his prophets. He did not speak through prophets. He didn't speak through his people this way. So after 400 years of just silence, people wondering what's happening, what's going to be next, blah, 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 all these things. The next thing you know, you got this crazy guy in camel hair eating bugs and wild honey in the desert. And you can imagine his hair had to have been crazy. It's not like he had a comb. And he's out there and he's preaching in the name of God for people to repent from their sins and to make straight the path of the Lord. And this is the first prophet, the first person speaking in the name of God for 400 years. So naturally, people are running out to the desert to hear what God has to say. They want to know if this is true. And some of them believed it wasn't true because the guy looked crazy. And can you blame him? I mean, think about if this was to happen today, right? If there's a guy way up the Kobuk Lake or, or Kobuk River, you know, and he's like surviving in the, in the wilderness and he's, he's putting out this like blast saying, hey, you guys repent, Jesus is coming back, right? And that was the first person that we heard of in 400 years who preached in the name of God. You can imagine what we might be experiencing. And that's who John was. And people flocked to him. It said, Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. I think this, is, this isn't this is the point of the message, but I, this is just like a tidbit. Guys, it doesn't matter what you look like. The word of the Lord is just as powerful being used through you as it's being used through anybody else on earth, Right? You can look crazy, you can be gothic, you can look however, right? Now, don't be sinful about it. Don't go out trying to, like, you know, look not good, you know, uh, in a sinful kind of way just to use the scripture. But, like, who cares what you look like? It has nothing to do with what John looked like here. It had to do with the word that was coming out of his mouth. And when God's word is spoken, God's word is powerful, God's word is God's word. It had nothing to do with John. It had everything to do with the fact that John was speaking in the name of the Lord and people responded to that. And they were, they were getting baptized. They were confessing their sins. It was so much so that even the Pharisees and the Sadducees came. And that's where John kind of spoke up and, and he shares this interesting thing. He said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And don't presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able to raise these stones, I'm sorry, for I tell you, God is able to raise from these stones children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now listen to this, okay? This next part is kind of... Uh, this is where we're really kind of starting to get into the meat of our passage today. So John at the moment is speaking to these Pharisees and these Sadducees, and he knows that they have a wicked, idolatrous heart. They're using religion as a form of personal gain, personal power. Uh, it's, it's, just, it's just a way for them to, to be built up instead of building up God, right? Now, don't get me wrong. These guys were righteous men. Not righteous in the form of salvation, but righteous in the form of their practice. They knew the law. They, the amount of education the Pharisees and the Sadducees had was so incredible. The things that they memorized, the things that they learned, they knew the scriptures inside and out. And that's what's kind of interesting about them, right? Because they knew the scriptures so well, they lived these righteous lives according to the law, and yet they were not believers in Christ. They missed it when Jesus came. And it's just because you know what the word says doesn't mean that the word has entered your heart. It may have just gone into your head. 
And then John says these words. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance. Now remember that. This baptism that John is giving is a baptism of repentance. Hey, you're a sinner. You sinned. Come, let me baptize you in a baptism of repentance. Repent of your sins and come out clean. Come out a new man, right? That was the baptism that John was doing. And then he starts talking up Jesus, right? And he says, there is one who is coming after me who is mightier than I am, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And he says, his winnowing fork is in his hand and he'll clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with an unquenchable fire. Now, John just went off the hook, and he's talking Jesus up. He's like, hey, look, I baptize you with water. Like, you repent of your sins, you get dipped in the lake, you come out, you're good, right? And he says, but there's a guy who's coming. I shouldn't even hold his sandals because he's so perfect. He's so holy. He's so amazing. His sandals I shouldn't even touch. I don't know if I can even look at this guy, right? And he's saying, and you know what? He's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire, That's crazy. He is totally talking up Jesus. So these people are listening and they're like, oh my gosh, who is this guy? Who is this guy? He's perfect. He doesn't need to be baptized. He's he's gonna baptize us in the Holy Spirit and in fire. What does that even mean? Right? And then this happens. Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. And John would have prevented him saying, but I need to be baptized by you and you come to me. And here's why John says that. Do you remember what this baptism is? It's a baptism of repentance. Well, we're talking about Jesus here. John just built up Jesus saying, I shouldn't even touch his sandals. He's going to baptize you in Holy Spirit and fire. And then Jesus comes and he's wanting to be baptized into a baptism of repentance But that's strange, right? Because Jesus never sinned. Jesus never messed up. How is he going to get baptized into a baptism of repentance? And John wanted to prevent him. Because John knew that John was a sinner. John wasn't Jesus. John sinned during his life. He, he messed up just like you and I have messed up, right? He was equally as, un, as deserving for the pits of hell as we are. John John was an incredible dude, but sin is sin, and he sinned. And John is like, hey, I cannot baptize you. This isn't right. This is not something that I want to do. I want you to baptize me because I'm a sinner, and you're clean. You're God, and I'm not. Baptize me. And Jesus said to him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. This is Jesus submitting to the will of the Father. Even though Jesus did not have to be baptized into a baptism of repentance, even though Jesus did not have to be cleansed of his sin because he had no sin, he still wanted to obey the commands of his Father. It was more important for Jesus to humble himself and be baptized than it was for him to stand up and be proud and say, I don't need this because I'm perfect. This really shows an incredible humility of who Jesus is. And then it was at that point that he consented. It says here in verse 16, chapter 3 of Matthew, it says, And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Now, this is kind of cool, guys, because it's at this moment that Jesus is kind of inaugurated into his life of ministry. And this is a time where it is confirmed publicly the identity of who Jesus is. Jesus is the Son of God, commanded by God himself, spoken to from the heavens that were split apart into a public space, where the thunders roared roared, and the the voice of the Almighty God stretched from, from the top of the earth and shouted down, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. 
This is God shouting from the heavens that Jesus is not just another man. Jesus is not just a prophet. Jesus is not just a good public speaker, but Jesus is the Son of God. And not only is he the Son of God, but God is well pleased in Jesus. Because Jesus is fulfilling all righteousness. Jesus is walking in perfect obedience with the Father. And God wanted to confirm his identity, not just to the public, but again to Jesus, even though Jesus already knows. Now there's another time, there's two separate times where God speaks publicly out of the earth again, out of the split open skies, right? The other time, he says, this is my son, listen to him, right? Another confirmation of the deity and sonship of God, of Jesus. And then another time in John chapter 12, verse 28, where he says, I have glorified my name and I will do it again. So th- this is one of the very important times where God found it necessary to speak from the heavens and call out the identity and sonship of our Lord. And so now what's amazing is it wasn't just Jesus who heard this, but it was everyone who was present. So this baptism holds some kind of significant meaning. And here's what did not happen at the baptism, okay? This is what did not happen. Jesus did not go in the water as a man and come out as a God. Jesus was always 100% man and 100% God. This baptism didn't turn him from man to deity. God was already, or Jesus was already God, right? Another thing that happened is that Jesus didn't go down as a sinner and come up righteous. Jesus was already righteous. This baptism of repentance did not have to do with Jesus repenting. It had to do with him fulfilling all righteousness, of being obedient to the law and obedient to God. Remember, Jesus says that not a dot, not a single iota of the law will pass, right? Jesus is fulfilling the law, fulfilling the customs of of what the Bible has talked about. But the baptism did not make Jesus Jesus. Jesus was Jesus, and he was in the baptism to fulfill the law. And another thing that did not happen is that Jesus didn't go down into the water as a man and come up as the Son of God. Jesus was the Son of God. Now, a lot we can read in a lot of things. And there's a lot of different teachings when it comes to this specific baptism. But the one thing I want you guys to remember is that this baptism did not change who Jesus was. Jesus was, from the start, the Son of God. Jesus, from the start, was 100% man. Jesus, from the start, was 100% God. Jesus, from the start, was 100% righteous. No sin in his life from the beginning to the end. Jesus was Jesus the entire time. But God is the one who spoke out in this moment, resting the Holy Spirit on the shoulder of of Jesus, saying, this is my son. Jesus already knew it, but now other people know it as well. And then we get this, oh, sorry, messed up something. And then we get this really, I, I never really thought of it before until you begin, until I began studying for, for this message. But remember, the Holy Spirit comes and rests on the shoulder of Jesus. And then it says here in chapter 4, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit. So the same Spirit that landed on, on Jesus led him to the wilderness. For what? To be tempted by the devil. Have you ever thought about what this meant? Here Jesus did something awesome. He was repented. I mean, I'm sorry, he was baptized into a baptism of repentance to fulfill all righteousness. God spoke to him. The Holy Spirit rested on him. And then he's led out from the water into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The Holy Spirit knew what he was doing. The Holy Spirit knew that he was going to take Jesus to the wilderness and that Jesus was going to experience 40 days and 40 nights of fasting. And then at the end of these 40 days and 40 nights, the Spirit knew that Jesus was going to be tempted by the devil. 
And you would think that the Holy Spirit would try to help Jesus not be tempted by the devil, right? You'd think that the Holy Spirit would want to lead Jesus away from all temptation, to not be even touched by the devil. And yet, that's not what it says here. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for the specific reason to be tempted by the devil. So let's look into it. So it says in verse 2, After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. There's not a lot you got to say about that, right? Yeah, he was hungry. Yeah, it's not even worth joking about. Of course he was hungry. Like, of course he was hungry. We in America baptized for 24 hours and were about dead. He went 40 days and 40 nights. 40 days and 40 nights. I can't even, I honestly can't even fathom what that is like. I can't even imagine what it was like to go 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness on your own, not eating, and he was hungry. And at that, and this, this, this isn't the first time that this has happened. Because remember, Moses, if you guys, if you guys look back, Moses fasted for 40 days without food or water two separate times. And both times had to do with when he was on the mountaintop with God. And these 40 days are, is kind of significant, right? 40 is representative of a time of testing, right? It was 40 days when Moses was on the mountaintop. He was in the presence of God. He was getting the tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments from God during these times. And it wasn't just a time of testing for Moses. It was also a time of testing for all of Israel because they were without their leader for 40 days. In fact, he was gone for so long that they thought he might have died. They didn't know what happened to him. And so that, that's when they decided, hey, let's take all of the gold that the Egyptians gave us and let's boil it down, let's melt it and turn it into a golden calf so we can worship this golden calf, right? So Israel failed the 40-day challenge. They did not make it at all. They, they lost. And Moses came down from the mountain. He saw that they did this thing. Moses went haywire, justifiably haywire, right? He smashed to bits this golden calf. He dumped, he killed all these people. He dumped the gold into the river and he made the survivors drink the golden water from the river. Like that, that, ugh, that had to hurt, right? That had to be uncomfortable. I'm just saying. And then Moses went back up. He broke the commandment, the stone tablet. So he went back and for another 40 days, he was in the presence of God fasting from food and water. And now here we have, and then there's another time. Joshua also did it. Elijah kind of did it. He ran about 140 miles and he had no food or whatever for 40 days. However, an angel two separate times brought him food to eat. So... Elijah didn't provide for himself, but God provided for him through one of the angels. So you can count that or not count that, whatever's up to you. But this number 40 represents a time of testing, a time of trial, a time to be obedient to God in perfect obedience when it's uncomfortable. And so Jesus was tempted for 40 days. I mean, not tempted for 40 days. He was fasting for 40 days and he was hungry. And now... You know what's interesting about that? It's after the 40 days that the tempter came and began to tempt him. But you know what? That doesn't mean that Jesus was not tempted for 40 days because he was fasting. And you know what? We have these three separate parts that we often get into. One is in the world. We give in to the world. We give in to the devil. And then we give in to our flesh. Now, a lot of us don't even need the devil to fall into sin, right? We just fall into sin on our own because we are naturally bent to sin. The devil doesn't need to come and make things harder for us. He's like, hey, you're doing a good job doing what you're doing. Follow the flesh. Follow the world. Just do what you're doing. I'm going to go mess with these other people, right? And so Jesus wasn't fighting against Satan at this time. Jesus had to suffer with his own body, with his own flesh. He had to submit to the will of God in the wilderness, 40 days without eating, 40 days on his own, 
40 days of being uncomfortable in the wilderness, no food, and Jesus was hungry. And despite his hunger, Jesus had to put aside the flesh that was calling out to him. Because remember, he was 100% man, 100% God and 100% man. And instead of giving in to his flesh, instead of giving in to his own personal desires, Jesus lived on the word of the Lord, believing that God was able to sustain him in the midst of his severe hunger, in the midst of this time of trial, in the midst of this time of testing. Jesus stood firm and put his flesh to the side and focused on the will of God. And that was what sustained him, was the food of his father. He put aside the world, knowing that he could walk to the nearest city and had everything that he wanted. He put aside the world, knowing that people may have looked at him like he was crazy. He put aside the temptation to follow the world and just give in to comfort, give in to to everything else that the world wants him to have. He put all that aside and he focused on being obedient to the will of God. And it was after those 40 days where Jesus was having to put aside the world, he was having to put aside the flesh, then the devil came. And that's when the devil came to begin to tempt him. And his first temptation was, if you're the son of God, command these stones become loaves of bread. Right? Now, naturally, when you read this, the thing you focus on is the is command these stones to become loaves of bread. That's what we believe the temptation is. And don't get me wrong, that was probably a severe low blow temptation from Satan because God was, Jesus was hungry, right? He was hungry. And naturally, like us people, don't do great with hunger, right? We even have a word for it called hangry. When you get so hungry that you're just mad, you're just Nothing is going to satisfy you. You're angry. You're irritated. Your husband, your wife, your spouse, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your mom, your dad, your sisters, whatever. Every single person on earth is going to be on your nerves for the rest of your life until they slap down a big pizza in front of you and you can eat your fill, right? Only then is everything okay. That's what we call hangry. It's part of the human condition. (laughs) We all get a little bit mad when we get angry, right? But I don't think we've gone 40 days without eating. Maybe you have. I don't know. If you have, comment below or something. Uh, Call us up on the podcast. But, But he went 40 days, and so Satan was like, yeah, command these stones to become bread. And Jesus could have done it. But that's not really what the problem was. Because if Jesus wanted to eat, he could command stones to become bread. The thing that we're looking at here are the first words. If you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, then command these stones to become bread. Satan is saying, hey, you think you're the son of God? I'm not so sure. You need to prove yourself to me. Prove your identity to me. Give in Uh, show me your power, show me who you are, because I'm not sure that you really are who you say you are. Satan was trying to get Jesus to doubt the identity of himself and to doubt the identity that God had just called on to him at the baptism. Jesus was just baptized, right? And at this baptized, that's when God said, this is my beloved son. And now Satan is saying, If you're the son, you'll do this. Satan is trying to get Jesus to doubt his identity and to doubt the word of God that has called this sonship down onto Jesus. As if Jesus has anything to prove to Satan. As if Jesus needs Satan's uh, permission or approval to be the son of God. Jesus needs nothing from the tempter. Satan needs nothing from the devil. I'm sorry. Jesus needs nothing from the tempter. Jesus needs nothing from the devil. Jesus doesn't need anything. He doesn't need permission. He doesn't need to prove himself. Jesus is who Jesus is despite what the devil is trying to tempt him or say to him, right? And so instead of giving in to this measly little temptation that Jesus could have easily done, Jesus says these words, it is written. Where was it written? Just so you know, Jesus wasn't quoting some obscure text. Jesus isn't quoting some like philosophical 
whatever popular movement at the time, right? When Jesus is saying it's written, he's meaning specifically in our holy scriptures, what we call now is the Bible. Jesus is referring back to the word of God. And he says, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. <clears throat> so this is Jesus's way of saying, hey, look, like, whatever, dude. <laughs> I know Jesus didn't say these words, probably. But he said, Satan, guess what? Like, I don't need to prove myself to you. I am who I am. I don't even need food, although I'm hungry, because I'm not sustained by this world. I'm not sustained by giving into my flesh. I'm not sustained by food. I am sustained by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Did Jesus need to eat? Absolutely. We, we are required to eat food on this world. We need to eat because we need to stay healthy. But more important than food is God's word. And if you, if you really think about it, when was the last time, and I'm guilty of this too, I, this is like just kind of coming to me as I talk about it, but when was the last time that you looked at scripture and said, I need this more than I need my next meal? When was the last time that we saw the scripture as what sustains us instead of the food in our refrigerator? Because food is pushed on us 24-7. We have commercials of Subway. We, I remember in Kotzebue, man, we'd be up in Kotz and, and we'd be sitting there watching TV and then you get these like Papa John's commercials and, and Chick-fil-A commercials. We don't even have Chick-fil-A in Alaska. And then you get commercials of Subway and we're sitting there, you know, 500 miles away from Anchorage, 30 miles above the Arctic Circle. No way to drive out of the city because we don't have roads out. You can only fly. And these commercials come on and you're just like, oh my gosh, dude, that subway looks so good, man. I want that Burger King Whopper. I want that Wendy's chicken sandwich, man. I want to go to Cane's and eat their chicken fingers. Like... When we were in Kotzebue, we did not take food for granted because either we didn't have it or we had to work our butts off to get it, going out in the country and shooting our food and harvesting it or trapping it or whatever, or we had to go to AC store and pay $100 for a Thanksgiving turkey, right? No matter what, getting food was something that we didn't take for granted because it cost us something. And now here I live in Anchorage and we have food everywhere I go. I can go to McDonald's and get something off their value meal, get full off of five bucks, right? It's awesome. It's extremely unhealthy. But the point is we see food everywhere we go. It's always pushed on us. It's, it's always right in our face. It's always accessible. And so constantly throughout the day we think, what am I going to eat? What are we going to have for lunch? What are we going to have for dinner? Should we cook at home or should we splurge and go out today? But when was the last time that we saw the word of God as more than just a book, as more than just a scripture or a text, but as something that literally and physically sustains us to get through the day? How much more would this scripture mean to us? How much more would we be into it? How much more would we be devouring it and living off of it if we saw this as our food first and then physical food second? How much more if we read this three whole meals a day, right? What if this was our breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then we ate food, uh, you know, in the meantime? Or... What about this? What would it look like if you switched the role of the Bible and your food? What if you read the Bible as much of you as you ate and you ate as much as you read the Bible? How long would you have gone without eating? How hungry would you be? And so this shows us the power of Scripture, the necessity of Scripture. We have to live not just by the food in our refrigerator, not just by bread alone, but we have to, have to, have to live by every word that comes of the mouth, from the mouth of God. This Bible, these words of God are not just verses to make us good people. These are Scriptures to sustain our life and our relationship with the Lord. And the devil, next up, says this. He said, well, the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, right? And he said to him, if you're the son of God, again, 
tempting him with his identity. Hey, if you are who you think God says you are, how many of you have heard that before? You get saved, you repent of your sin or whatever, and you hear this small voice on the side of you saying, do you really think that God saved you? Do you really think that you are a son of God? Do you really think you're adopted into his kingdom? Do you really think that you are holy and righteous and redeemed? Do you really think that God would do that for you? Maybe somebody else, but God wouldn't do that for you. Have you heard that before? An attack from Satan on your identity that God has made you a son or daughter in him? Well, this is what he's doing again. He says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you and on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Now, here's what's significant about this. This shows that Satan knows scripture. Satan's not an idiot, right? He is an idiot, but he's not a scriptural idiot. He knows the word of God. Why? Because he was with God before. Before Satan was Satan, Satan was Lucifer up there with with God as as one of the angels, right? He He was in the heavens. He knew the word of God. He knew who God is. And so Jesus says, hey, look, I don't need your bread. I need the word of God. And Satan says, hey, I actually know the word of God. And let me tell it to you. He says, you can throw yourself down because the Bible says that he'll command his angels concerning you. And the Bible also says on their hands they'll bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. So Satan is taking the word of God and thinking, hey, I'm going to use, I'm going to fight fire with fire. I'm going to use scripture against scripture. But you know what? Whenever scripture comes and scripture comes on its own as its own separate thing, Something happens to it. It gets twisted and turned because it's used out of context. These scriptures right here have nothing to do with Satan, with what Satan is talking about. These scriptures are twisted. They're used against what the rest of the scripture says. And they're used in a form that goes from scriptural accuracy to temptation, right? To twisting. And guys, we are not, we're not separate from this temptation today. Scripture is used out of context so often to the fact where people actually use scripture to promote the sin that they're in. We see this with, with, uh, you know, we see this with, with the LGBTQIA plus movement, right? Where, where people, a lot of, uh, some of the gay affirming churches or whatever, they'll teach that sin has been wiped out completely. Sin is no more. And that the, uh, it says so in the Bible, and so it's, it's okay to live the lifestyle you want to live because you're no longer in sin. You are like, God has taken care of sin completely. No, that's not true because the Bible says that when we are in Christ, we are dead to sin. How can we live in sin if we are dead to it? You're either alive in sin or you're alive in God. There is no in-between. And people use Scripture and use it as, as, as a, not just a way to flee from sin, but they now use scripture as a way to live in sin. And guess what? That is demonic. That is evil. That is using scripture to promote the one thing that can send you to hell forever. Sin. That's not what God's scripture is for. It's not used to find loopholes. It's not used to try to try to cherry pick the things that work for you and the things that don't work for you. The Bible is here to sustain us. The Bible is going to push us. The Bible is going to convict us. The Bible is going to tell us, hey, you have been living in sin, but I have called you to righteousness. Repent and turn back to me. Come back in relationship. Come back in unity with me because God does not want you in sin. God wants you in unity and righteousness with you. So here Satan is twisting and perverting and taking out of context the word of God, trying to prove to Jesus that this scripture actually doesn't mean what it does actually mean. And Jesus comes back and he says, hey, you think you know scripture. I know what you're doing because I also know scripture. And yes, you're saying these things. But Jesus said to him, again, it's written. Again, it's written. You shall not put the Lord your God, to the test. Guys, Scripture used in context, Scripture rightfully uh, 
understood, Scripture rightly interpreted, Scripture illuminated by the Holy Spirit, set from our minds, moved to our heart to change our relationship, to change our walk. This is always going to be more powerful than the Scripture used to give you what you want. It is so important for us, guys, to know the Scripture and to know it correctly, to study it, to be in it, to be sustained by it like we're sustained by food. Guys, the Scripture is important. And so the last one, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I'll give to you if you fall down and worship me. Now notice, Satan no longer is, is trying to qu- have Jesus question his identity. That's not going to work. Satan is no longer trying to use scripture against Jesus because Jesus knows the scripture inside and out, right? So that's gonna, not going to work. So the last thing that Satan wants to tempt Jesus with is power and authority and riches of the world, right? So he says, just fall down and worship me and I'll give you all of this, all of their glory, all everything that you see here, the kingdoms, the world, I'll give it to you. Just fall down and worship me. He's saying, it's nothing. Just, just bow your knee to me and you will have more riches than you can ever imagine. And that's when Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Do you think that this covers such a wide variety of sinful temptations? It covers identity. It covers our flesh. It covers the world. It covers uh, our pride. It covers what we want with our eyes, what we want with our flesh. It covers uh, what we want with our life. These sins are things that I think we would all fall into, at least one of them, right? At least one of them would be extremely tempting to all of us. And yet, Jesus fulfilled this time by living sin free, by being tempted with the things that Adam was tempted with, right? This is why we call Jesus a second Adam. Because in the garden, Adam was tempted with something very similar. We're going to talk about this on the pod- podcast more this week, okay? So stay tuned into that. I don't have enough time to cover it all today. But Adam was covered or tempted with something extremely similar. And he fell into the sin. And by the sin of Adam, sin entered into the world. And we are all now uh, consequently able to die, right? We have lost that unity with God. We have lost that peace with God. Now, through Jesus, Jesus has upheld where Adam fell, right? Jesus was tempted with all of these things. And yet, instead of giving in to temptation, instead of giving in to sin, Jesus gave in to the word of God and put his flesh aside, put his life aside, put the world aside, was sustained by the word of God. And the word of God is what carried him through temptation, And now, like death came in sin through the life of Adam, now life comes through the life of Jesus. Guys, here's the thing, okay? This shows us the calling and commission of God. He is the Son of God. He is 100% man, 100% God. And this is where Jesus is now going to be Begin his ministry. In fact, the next little subheading under verse 11 says Jesus begins his ministry. Jesus had to go through this baptism. He had to go through this temptation. And now Jesus is ready to enter into the world to put everything aside and live in perfect obedience with the Father like he had done his entire life. And now nothing is going to be able to stray him from his direction, to stray him from his calling to move him from side to side. Jesus is 100% in alignment and obedience to, Christ, to God the Father. And Satan is learned, has learned that he can't redirect him. He can't do it. And another thing I want you guys to know here is that Jesus did not rely on his own strength to get through these temptations. He didn't squeeze his abs and flex his arms real hard and try just really, really hard to say no to to the temptations that Satan has given him. Jesus relied on the power of the Holy Spirit, of the power of the Scripture, of the power of God's Word. 
And I think that this is something that we should and definitely should pull out from this is that when we are dealing with scriptures ourselves, Jesus didn't rely on his own strength. Jesus relied on the power of God. And we will not get through the temptations that hit us in our everyday life in the world, through our flesh, or through the devil if we try to rely on our own strength. And know the word of God. Live in the word of God. Be sustained by the word of God. And when temptation hits, stand on the word of God. And you will not be rocked. You will not be moved. And listen, this is the last thing we're going to pull out here. This is really quick. Verse 11 says, The devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. You know what's so funny about that is just a couple scriptures back, Satan used this scripture to try to tempt Jesus. Look, verse 6. It says, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. Well, his angels were commanded at the very end of this. They were commanded to go down by God and minister to Jesus. Did the angels save Jesus from temptation? No. Did the angels, uh, you know, swoop down and after Jesus threw himself off the thing? No, because Jesus didn't throw himself down, right? What the angels did do is come down and minister to the Lord, to minister to Jesus. So even though Satan used this scripture out of context and he used it as a form of temptation, the scripture was actually fulfilled, but fulfilled righteously, fulfilled the correct way and not the way that Satan wanted it to be, that he was kind of perverting it to be, right? So that's really cool that that the scripture proved itself in this very moment. And so guys... This is such a huge part of understanding the life and time and ministry of Jesus. And the application of this that I want you guys to know is to know who Jesus is, right? There's a lot of things that we talked about that you can apply to your life, but sometimes knowing who Jesus is more is the application that we really need. And do you know how you're going to know Jesus more? It's right here in front of you. It's right here in front of you. Depend on this more than you depend on the food in your fridge. Depend on the scripture more than you depend on your own strength. Depend on this more than you depend on anything else. Because God uses his scripture to, to convict us of sin and to save us from sin. To save us from ourselves. To save us from wrath. This scripture will draw us closer to God and further away from ourself. And so that's what we're learning today, guys. I'm super happy I got to share this time with you. What an amazing moment in the life of Jesus. And I cannot wait to continue going through uh, this entire book with you guys. Um, I would encourage you to be reading through Matthew. Uh, You know, read through it with us. Read ahead. Um, See what you see out of it. And we'll talk about it during uh, this during this time. We'll talk about it during the podcast. And remember, um, we do ho- post our podcast every week. Uh, we haven't done it for our past two guest speakers, but if we don't have a guest speaker, we post it every single week, usually on Wednesday or Thursday, sometimes Friday, but not really. And we go deeper into the scripture that we read, and we hit on topics that we didn't have enough time to hit on today. So that's one thing you're not going to want to miss. Also, on top of that, guys, for the next, only like the next week or so, we're continuing our uh, fundraising support to support the Dwelling Place and the Dwelling Place Lounge podcast. So you can see right here, we have this thing, www.customink.com forward slash fundraising forward slash TDPAK. That's the Dwelling Place Alaska, TDPAK. Um, If you guys would, we would really appreciate y'all to um, go and support our ministry by by buying one of our limited edition hoodies. And after that, we are going to have a dwelling place store on the internet where you can buy stuff, but you will not be able to buy these hoodies at that store. This is only a limited edition thing. All right, guys. So thank you very much. Love you guys. So thankful for you all. And I hope you are blessed this week. And I'll be looking forward to talking to you and uh, hearing from you guys on the podcast. See ya.